This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode number 303 of Literary Treks, your dedicated Star Trek books and comics podcast here on the Trek FM network. I am one of your hosts, Dan Gunther, and joining me, as he does every time these days, is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, you look to be quite amused. I'm just so amused, because I'm here every time. Every time. (laughs) <laughs> that you announce me, I'm here. I just think that's fabulous. It's amazing. It's it's like, you know, it's like speaking Q's name and he just shows up. He just appears. It's it's brilliant. I love it. You know, uh, anyway, the thing is, we just struggle sometimes because, you know, we start a podcast. We're like, oh, we need to start recording. Let's record. And then it's like we don't even know what we're going to say at the beginning. And so we end up like almost every podcast here on the Trek FM network saying the same thing, saying, hi, I'm so and so. And this is a so and so podcast. And with me, like he always is. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, we need to come up with something more clever. So I'll put the challenge out there to our listeners if they want to write us a funny little introduction or not even funny but it's just a really professional introduction and if we like one of them we might use it sometime hmm i like that because yeah i do the same thing like i briefly kind of think okay how am i going to start it and then my brain just kind of lapses into the usual da 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 you know the the pattern of how we've been starting the episodes which you know is fine but you know it's got to get a little boring for everyone out there so yeah that's a good challenge i like that yeah, I hope we're not boring anybody right now, but it's the same issue we have when we record our other podcast called Positively, Positively Trek. Trek. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> I know what you're saying right now, everyone. Wait, you have another podcast? Yes, we do. And we've already got a dozen episodes out there, so check it out. I'm not even going to tell you what it's about. Just the name alone says what it is. That's what yeah. it is. And it's been a lot of fun, you know, and Bruce and I really enjoy podcasting together. We've done it for so many episodes here on literary treks and we just want to we there's more that we want to talk about in star trek so you know this was a kind of a nice outlet to do that so yeah and that shows just scratching the surface if you listen to it hey you know what it's gonna get even better and crazier as time goes on yeah definitely and on today's feature we are going to be starting a new trilogy Star Trek Voyager String Theory. This is three books. The first one, book one, Cohesion by Jeffrey Lang, we're covering in today's episode. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll cover books two and three as well. So it should be interesting. These are books I've never read before doing this. So uh, I I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I've never read these either. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, hey, what can we do? Um, You know, we've done a lot of post TNG books lately, and this is the 25th anniversary of Voyager, and it's like, ooh, we should do like a Voyager series. And sure enough, string theory, three books. It's like, why not? So we're going to do all three in a row. Absolutely. But before we get to that, we do have a bit of news to cover, and it's also Star Trek Voyager related, which is awesome because this is something we've been waiting for for a long time. I think it's safe to say now that 
this might actually see the light of day when they're saying it will see the light of day. I am talking, of course, about the newest book by Kirsten Beyer, Star Trek Voyager, To Lose the Earth. Currently scheduled for release on October 13th of this year. It's been on the schedule for a little bit. We've kind of held our breath because it's been on the schedule before and been moved, but we have new cover art to talk about. So I feel like I I can get optimistic now that we're actually going to see this book. What do you think, Bruce? I am thrilled that we have a cover because yes, this makes me feel like, Ooh, this might actually happen this year. I'm feeling more confident about that. And I don't remember who said it, but it's somebody in the know told us one time that no, it's, it's more likely going to happen this year uh by october i'm still not holding my breath things could change uh (laughs) but that's with any book too but yeah this definitely tells me this isn't just some publicity stunt of people saying like oh yeah and then the voyager novels come out later this year and that's it and then we never hear anything this is something where it's like no if there's a cover then we're close to making this happen which by the way the string theory series that we're talking about kirsten Beyer wrote the second book which we'll review on the next episode and it was her first voyager novel yeah so this cover i think it's beautiful i mean as is kind of typical of the books in this series we've got a gorgeous shot of voyager kind of dominating the middle of the cover with kind of this nebula background and some lens flares from a star nearby and you see kind of another starship off in the background and kind of the near the Star Trek Voyager title, this kind of yellow golden nebula going on. I think this is a gorgeous cover. Yeah, I do too. I'm just wondering which starship that is back there. I can't remember because I know there was just a few left in the Delta Quadrant, but I can't remember the name of the ships or anything like that off the top of my head. But yeah, it's a gorgeous cover. I love the coloring. Uh, Again, this is something I would put up as a poster Mm -hmm. if it came out that way. Definitely. Yeah. And it's interesting. You mentioned that about not remembering the names of the ships and that sort of thing. It's been a while. It's been quite a while since the last book in the series, which ended on a pretty big cliffhanger. I feel like I'm going to want to reread that novel before picking this one up. You know, it, it, there's, there's a lot going on and it's hard to kind of keep it all straight with how many books we've read in the meantime. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to remember when that was, um, but it's been at least a year and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. Something like that. It's been quite a while, for sure. Well, we also do have a back cover blurb, uh, which I can read. And I guarantee, without even looking at it, I bet you the words long-awaited are in there somewhere, because it definitely has been. The long-awaited follow-up to Voyager, Architects of Infinity, from the New York Times best-selling author and co-creator of Star Trek Picard. As the crew of the Full Circle fleet works to determine the fate of their lost ship, the Galen, a struggle for survival begins at the far edge of the galaxy. New revelations about Species 001, the race that built the biodomes that first drew the fleet to investigate planet DK-1116, force Admiral Catherine Janeway to risk everything to learn the truth. Oh, I mean, that sounds good, but at the same time, I'm thinking, I think this is the last one, though. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I think so, too. (laughs) Ah, man, a lot of numbers in that, I noticed. DK1116, Species 001. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm assuming seven of nine will be in it, so there's a couple more numbers there. (laughs) Yeah, lots of numbers. Now, I'm I'm really excited about this. I mean, her novels are so good, and I just think they're some of the best Star Trek novels out there right now. And if anybody who's not a big Voyager fan... I mean, I've talked to so many people that said, I'm not really that big into Voyager, but I love these books and it makes me want to watch Voyager and appreciate Voyager even more. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've told that to a lot of people who are not that big on Voyager as well, you know, saying like, pick up full circle, give that a try and go through. They're really, really great novels. So I'm sure this one will hold up to those as well, because I've yet to be disappointed by anything Kirsten Byers put out. So very excited for this one. Yeah. And I just looked, uh, she was on two years ago talking about this book with us. So it's been two years and it was episode number 225. So that oh, was wow. when the last Voyager novel. So this, when it comes out in October, would be two and a half years since the previous one. Man, so, that's crazy. 
a lot of things have changed now that she's worked on Discovery and now Picard. And the cover even points out that she's co-creator of Star Trek Picard. Yeah, I was going to say, I love that she gets that credit on the cover. Uh, very well deserved. I mean, her career has gone some, an ama- some amazing places in the last few years. So uh, very excited that we're getting this book. I mean, I feel like it would be pretty easy to... Um, maybe not be able to come back to this project after how busy her life is with all the other stuff going on. So, so happy that we get a resolution to this story. Yeah, me too. But, you know, if she wants to quit the shows, that's fine. Because, Kirsten, you can always come back to writing. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, we'll we'll take Star Trek however you want to give it to us. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, we also have some feedback that we want to review from the Babel Conference for our last episode, Literary Treks 302, What If AI Becomes Mommy? And you might remember that was our episode about the novel The Unsettling Stars, written by Alan Dean Foster, and we had him on the show to talk about that novel, which was a lot of fun. In that episode, we also talked about a comic written by Aaron Eisenberg, and the first comment here by Justin Ozer has to do with that. He says, I loved the Aaron Eisenberg written comic, The Rules of Diplomacy. Thank you for covering this one. I noticed there's another actor written comic from that time, Blood and Honor, written by Mark Leonard. It's also a DS9 comic, which is really intriguing. Any plans to cover that one too? Hmm. Well, he's also included the cover here, and I have to say it looks quite intriguing. I would certainly not be opposed to covering this one. Yeah, I think this was the only other one. I think there was just these two celebrity ones, um, which is sad because both of them have passed away. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I I need to write it down. Uh, Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. You want to do that in an upcoming episode? Make me the next episode? I think we can do that. I think we can manage that for sure. All right. Oh, no. I'm, I just made a note, but it's in my business notes. So <laughs> I'll have to transfer that somewhere else later. But yeah, so it's noted and it's going to happen. So everybody look for that comic and uh, read it for our next episode. I got to say, I'm looking forward to hearing about the business meeting where you bring up the Mark Leonard penned Deep Space Nine comic uh, at your regular job because it's in your business notes now. <laughs> I would love to. That would just make my day. (laughs) Well, you know, Justin, he didn't stop there. He posted another comment. He says, great interview. I don't think I've heard an interview with Alan Dean Foster before. So it was wonderful to hear him talk about the novel as well as the motion picture, the movie industry, and so much more. I really enjoy the unsettling stars. Like you, it was great that the problem was that the alien species were too helpful instead of them being a more traditional villain. That was very interesting to read about, and I love the discussion about the potential for AI to take over in a similar way by being too helpful. I give this novel four out of five, Spock's realizing that something is amiss while everyone else thinks everything is fine. <laughs> So I like I like that rating there. <laughs> yeah, I love that rating. That's really clever. Um, I, I wonder what four out of five Spocks realizing something is, is amiss, what that discussion would look like. I think that'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's like there's four Spocks, but what's the fifth one doing if he's not there? Yeah. Hmm. Well, Oztrek, he <laughs> says, I'm glad you enjoyed the settling stars. Oops, sorry, the unsettling stars. Okay, I know. I screwed up. I knew the title. It just, I don't know why I said it that way. It's weird. Uh, It happens to all of us. Uh, Well, he goes on. He says, I loved this story. It's been a long time since we've had a story like this. Killing them with kindness could have been the title for the book. I did feel that the book ended rather suddenly, but I did enjoy it overall. I'd give this 4.5 acts of overpowering helpfulness out of 5. This is the first time I've heard Alan Dean Foster interviewed. It was great to get his thoughts on this novel and Star Trek history from his point of view. I also loved the review of The Rules of Diplomacy. No surprise Aaron Eisenberg captured the voice of Nog so well. Well, thanks as always for your comments. And yeah, uh, I loved how well the voice of Nog came through in that comic. That was a real treat to be able to read. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting that Justin and Oz Trekkie both comment that this is the first time they've heard Alan Dean Foster interviewed. Um, I'm sure I've heard him interviewed years ago, but it's been a long time. And I'm not saying from a podcast, but just from somewhere, of course. But um, 
you know, it, it was great fun to talk to him. I met him briefly at Star Wars Celebration uh, about five years ago. And uh, yeah, after the interview, he said he'd like to come back on Literary Trek sometime. So I say to Alan, that's fine, Alan. You just have to write another Star Trek novel to come back on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We'd love to have him back on the show and, you know, we'd love to have more Star Trek novels from him for sure. Unless we read the Star Trek logs in a feature. Huh. Interesting. Mm. Aaron Harvey might be interested in that one too. Hmm. Interesting. Well, (laughs) we'll leave that there for now. I'm sure people might have something to say about that in the Babel Conference. But what do you say we get to our feature and talk about this week's novel, Star Trek Voyager, String Theory, Book One, Cohesion? Well, as I said this week, we are discussing the first book in the String Theory trilogy from Star Trek Voyager by author Jeffrey Lang. This one is called Cohesion. Now, this story is an interesting one. It came out at a time that there had already been Star Trek Voyager relaunch novels published. This came out after the Spirit Walk duology by Christy Golden that we covered in some previous episodes of the show. But it's set during the Star Trek Voyager series, which is, you know, something that the other series have not really gone back and done very often. You know, after the TNG relaunch, we never got any stories that are set back during the voyages of the Enterprise D, you know, that sort of thing. This is kind of a unique thing in Star Trek literature. It's very specifically set at a particular point in Voyager's history, right in between seasons four and five. It's kind of a unique place to set it because that was one of the few seasons later on in Voyager that didn't have like a two-parter cliffhanger that led from one season into the into the next. So it's a nice little spot to put something. The end of season four was the episode Hope and Fear, where they had the whole adventure with Arturus and the Dauntless. And then season five opened with the episode Night, where they're traveling across that whole starless void and they encounter the Malon for the first time in that episode. So, Bruce, what do you think about where this story is set and kind of the the choice to go back to a story set during the series? I think it's important to point out that one of the reasons they went back to a, a story that takes place during the series, this was celebrating the 10th anniversary of Voyager. As a matter of fact, at the top of the novel, it says a 10th anniversary odyssey. Oh, I like the way they say that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would, Somebody had their thesaurus out that day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I would like to see them do more stuff like this. I mean, we've had so many of the post TNG and post Enterprise and post DS9. I don't know why we don't occasionally go back in time to these earlier periods, why everything has to be post something. So I'm I'm glad it you know, at that time when they hit the post Voyager novels that they decided to go back to sometime during the period of the series. And as for as far as this time, I didn't even think about what you would until you had said it about cliffhanger episodes leading from one season to another, that this is a perfect place to put these novels so you don't have that cliffhanger thing that you're falling into a middle of a two part episode. And you know, we've got Seven of Nine, who's only been there for the first season, so she's still a fairly new character, which the author is able to play with in this novel, which we'll talk about later, her relationship with Belana Torres. So I, I like that it took place during this period of time. Yeah, and it's very specifically set in this period of time. I, I like that the author is using little, just little tidbits, little hints throughout the story to really link it to this period. So, for example, Tom Paris is kind of thinking in his head about maybe doing something like this Captain Proton holodeck series, and you see the kind of formation of that. If you remember the next episode after this is set, Night is the first time we see Captain Proton as well. So he's just working on that right now. And, you know, all these little hints, we've got, of course, the antagonism between Bolana Torres and Seven of Nine that was very much present during that fourth season being played with. And we'll definitely talk about that as we get into the novel later. So yeah, he's really using this time period to its full advantage. And the novel in the early part of it has Tom Paris really craving mushrooms. 
And <laughs> there's a discussion about growing mushrooms on a starship. And I thought, how funny is this? Because that's what they do in Discovery. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but not to eat. But did you not think about Discovery when you read him talking about spores on a starship? I think I do remember that floating through my head when I was reading that part. It was very, yeah, very near the beginning of the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's talking about setting up, you know, a spore growth and stuff. So, yeah. yeah Cause he's like, can thinking, you do that on a starship? And I'm thinking, yeah, it was done a century before this. <laughs> it's like, oh, are they setting up their own spore drive? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that will get you home quick. Definitely. <laughs> so early on in this book, We've got this. I actually really liked this little bit at the beginning where Tom Paris is all excited to get off duty and go see Bellana and bring her her favorite meal and kind of have this whole romantic evening. And he hears like Harry Kim at op at ops go, hmm, that's weird or something like that. And he's going, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't I don't want anything weird. I don't want any anomalies. I don't want any alien ships. I just want to go off duty. And uh, I, I really like that because so often, of course, in Voyager, we get that's how this how an adventure starts, right? Harry Kim picks up something weird on scanners and they go to investigate or whatever, and everybody doesn't seem to be able to get a break. So I like that. <laughs> yeah. So it does. It's very classic Voyager, the way it starts mm -hmm. off. Yeah. And that's one thing I noticed throughout this book, too, that I want to say it very much feels like a Voyager story. There's one thing about Voyager is they didn't shy away from having weird anomalies and strange things. And in that way, this feels very rooted in what Star Trek Voyager was all about. So in this novel, Voyager encounters a star system that shouldn't be possible. It's a binary system that includes a white dwarf, which is putting out a huge amount of radiation but the weird part is there's a civilization living on a planet within its zone of influence of this radiation, which is really weird because this radiation is so strong that it shouldn't be able to allow life to arise to exist here. I like how weird this system is, and I, I kind of liked Harry's whole running commentary through the whole book where he keeps saying, like, I really hate this system because it's, you know, playing havoc with Voyager and it shouldn't exist the way it is. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it until you just were saying this, but this is a lot of what I wanted from Voyager when it started, because when I read that the series was going to take place in another part of our galaxy, I thought, Oh, it could be really strange. And yeah, we got some th strange things in there, but this is what I expected was things don't really work out the way they work out on our side of the galaxy. Things operate maybe just a little differently and a little more weird or what we would consider to be weird. And so that's what we're finding here. It's like, okay, sure. There's a white dwarf, but how is it possible that there's a civilization living near that, that that's impossible. And then we find some other things out as we read the book that this white dwarf isn't quite like, other white dwarfs and there's other things going on here that aren't quite what we're used to and everybody's basically scratching their heads throughout this book going what's going on this doesn't usually operate this way but at the same time they're like yeah but we've seen this before where things aren't always what we expect and that's what i really enjoy about this novel yeah, I think like, I feel like early Voyager, like I think about those first season episodes like Parallax and Time and Again, where there was, you know, some weird temporal anomaly or like Voyager was stuck inside a black hole, but didn't realize it or something like that, mm -hmm. where they, they really kind of did these out there type things. And then later on, it feels like we get more of the kind of bumpy headed aliens of the week and just typical star trek stuff but yeah this real this real weirdness i like that about voyager yeah it's almost like you want to call voyager star trek the weird voyages or something yeah <laughs> or like star trek voyager anomaly or something like that. <laughs> it seems they're always dealing with anomalies they're flying into living nebulas or you know whatever <laughs> yeah but I, I mean, I like this whole thing, how this plays out with um, the alien race and the ship that they run into. And, you know, as always, Voyager's there to help things along and, and be there to assist. And 
things don't always work out as planned. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's definitely the case here. Voyager encounters this huge, this gargantuan refugee ship. And uh, basically, it's, you know, quite a bit technologically behind Voyager. It uses nuclear explosions against a pusher plate to propel the ship forward. But it has run aground. Basically, it's come to a stop. Uh, Voyager almost collides with it. They're kind of stuck in this area of space as well. They've kind of, I guess, run aground. <laughs> it's not really the right phrase here, but they're they're stuck. They can't move in space. And Voyager attempts to help them out. I love the kind of view of Voyager that these aliens had. They're like this little tiny ship with its tiny engines can go faster than light. And we've got this big, huge ship that requires this huge apparatus to move it through space. I, I thought that was an interesting little juxta juxtaposition. I love early ideas for space travel. And like this one, for example, is something that earth scientists have theorized could work to propel a starship. And people have dr dr drawn up plans for ships like this. I, I love the idea of like ancient technology being used in this way and our futuristic Voyager people encountering it. Yeah. And I love how, this is like a love fest. We keep saying we love, we love, <laughs> but I mean, I, I do. I love how this ship feels very alien, uh, even though we were never really aboard the ship. We don't really get to explore the ship. Uh, I mean, just briefly, but we don't really get to know it that well, but it's, it's assembled with all these containers. So it's huge, but it's got all these different containers that sound like it's a, a Lego set with d different bunch of Legos that really don't belong together, but they just kind of smush them all together, but not assembled correctly, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but each of these containers contains almost like uh, each, each container was, was brought into this by different families or individuals that they brought their own container to assemble onto the ship for transportation. And so, yeah, it really sounds very odd it's like I sometimes have a hard time picturing exactly what this would look like because it's so alien. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's times where I read a Star Trek novel where I'm like, okay, I'm having a hard time picturing this alien or this ship or something. But at the same time, I'm like, well, that's probably good because that means it's really alien and it's not something that's normal that I could see that I can associate with. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, this ship is really interesting. It, it Like you said, all these containers are kind of you know, coupled together and, you know, each container contains, I don't know exact numbers, but in all this ship has thousands of refugees aboard it. And basically they're separated from the crew. The crew is in this forward compartment, but all these containers have these people that are expecting to be in there for a long period of time as it makes this slow journey to this next star that they're trying to get to. Voyager, they say, oh, we can help you out. We can, you know, tow you and get you there much faster. So they, you know, attempt to help them. However, disaster strikes. And this whole book, the the first part of it is interesting because the, the um, beginning of the book has kind of like right at this point of disaster. And then it goes a little bit back in time and shows you the kind of lead up to this disaster, which you find out is the complete destruction of this ship. Basically, they get it kind of a certain distance away from their home system, just past this like edge of this space, and it seems to just come apart. And I think they said like shards of matter. It just kind of shatters and disperses and comes apart on a molecular level. All, and all of them are killed except for the group of five people who are aboard Voyager when this ship is destroyed. So it starts out with a huge tragedy here. Yeah, and each chapter at the beginning for the first, I think, five or six chapters starts with a heading that says disaster minus so many minutes. So it's showing you leading up to the disaster, how close we are getting to the disaster. And then when you get to chapter five, after the explosion, it's disaster plus one minute. And I think then in the next chapter, it does another plus, but then we kind of abandon that concept for the rest of the story. So I liked how that structure was put into these chapters. And yeah, the ship just kind of, 
it, it's it, it almost it's not like a ship explosion that you're used to. It's like you said, it's almost like picturing someone who's carrying um, a big bucket of ice and they just drop it, just you know, and mm-hmm. just all this ice everywhere. It's almost how I picture it. It's just like little just shards of ice flying everywhere. That's not exactly what this is, but it's almost sounded like that to me. And it was really odd for this Voyager crew to see this too, because they're questioning, you know, what just happened? Was that an explosion? Were they attacked or something? You know, what's going on? But they have members of the species on their ship because the captain and a few others were visiting at the time on Voyager. So they experienced this happening by watching the destruction of their ship and they're upset, but at the same time they're not. I mean, there's a conversation between captain Ziv and one of his crewmen where his crewman's like, you know, I feel bad, but not really because it wasn't me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And the captain's like, yeah. And they didn't experience it because it happened so fast. They're probably not even aware. There was probably no suffering. So they're, they're not happy about it, but they're also kind of okay with it, you know? And yeah. I, I also think there's probably something in their society where they realize that there's been so many ships that have left the planet. And I think that they know that more than likely they may not make it. And so maybe they even come to that understanding that if this happens, it's kind of expected. So we're prepared for it. Yeah. And I also got a kind of tragic feeling of it in that they talk about how the quality of life on their planet is so bad. And I mean, these people they're they're you can see they're suffering from like radiation burns and stuff. They're not healthy as a species. So part of me wonders if they're kind of thinking like, well, you know, that's still a better fate than remaining back on their home planet, which is really sad to think about, you know, that at least they were spared having to live back there again. Which, yeah. you know, made me feel really bad for them. And later in the novel, uh, Captain Ziv says that he, at some point, when he returns to the, his home planet, he's going to have to meet with these families and give them the unfortunate news. But uh, there was a funny exchange going on where uh, Neelix is trying to get them coffee, but they the smell of coffee was too offensive for them or something. Oh, oh yeah. It was the type of tea he was yeah, or getting tea, himself yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. There was, and he was offering to him. They're like, Oh, it smells bad or whatever. And throughout this novel, there's always things coming up about coffee and tea <laughs> <laughs> quite often, which I always think is funny because I don't know what it is. I know we always make fun and, and talk about, Catherine Janeway and her, having to have her coffee, but I'm not a big coffee drinker. But when I do drink coffee, I'm always thinking of Janeway now. I can't drink coffee without seeing Janeway in my mind. Yeah, I always hear her coffee black <laughs> <laughs> replicator order, right? <laughs> it's like even when I'm at work and somebody goes, Hey, I'm going to grab a cup of coffee. You want to come with me? I just want to start like pretending I'm Janeway going, Did you say coffee? Yes, yes. I. Let's go get coffee. You know? <laughs> There's coffee in that nebula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Definitely. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this alien race. So we get to know kind of the five that are aboard and Captain Ziv is their leader. They're the Menorhans. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. That's kind of where I went with it. Menorhans. I'll go uh, with that. Okay, perfect. Well, we meet <laughs> several of them in this novel. Um, I, I do have to say, I love how much work went into crafting their personalities and their relationships. You know, I feel like a lot of times alien races are just kind of monolithic in Star Trek. That's kind of something Star Trek's known for. Uh, and, and they're fully realized this culture. Obviously, there's been a lot of thought put into how this culture operates and, and how they work together. And then even just in the characters we meet, the relationships between them. So, you know, later on in the novel, we'll meet some, you know, scientists who have broken away from the main government and are doing their own thing and the personal relationships they have with some of the Menorans we meet here and later in the novel as well. I thought that was really interesting. And I I find myself wanting to learn more about this species as I read. Well, I think you probably will, since this is a three-book series, so I think we will learn even more about them. But it's funny you say that, because that's pretty much what the crew of Voyager was saying. 
uh, I can't remember which character, I think it was Chakotay, was saying, you know, I think, you know, it'd be great to stick around for a long time because it's a very interesting species and it'd be interesting to get to know them more and know more about them. And Simon and Schuster said, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and Janeway says to Chakotay, why don't we do this in three books? And he's like, that sounds great, Catherine. Um, and then she's like, look, a monkey. But then, no, forget that part. Um, so, <laughs> well, I, I got to say, though, I got to wonder if Chakotay is like, oh, this is a three parter. Does that mean that you and I have to come to blows over some decision? I mean, that's what happens in almost every two parter. So I can't imagine what it's like for a three parter. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that will happen many times. But um, so, yeah, this this alien race, um, they have uh, psionic abilities. Their language is very different, have like certain clicks and sounds that the universal translator has a hard time uh, picking up and, and translating for a little while. It eventually starts to get it um, later. Uh, there was one reference that their arms are long, that they they have long necks, they have long chins. And uh, their arms are kind of long. At one point, uh, it was even referenced that they kind of look gorilla-like. Mm -hmm. And I remember later in the book, Chakotay just... This is part of the weird things that come later, but he kind of refers to them, you know, looking dog-like. Um, mm -hmm. And he says that to them. And they're like, oh, I don't think your Universal Translator is looking, working right, because you just called us, like, dogs or something. And he's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're also from, on their planet, they have like these 13 or 14 city-states. And so they're all like subdivided because the planet has been going through a century of this radiation from the white dwarf that they used to live further apart, maybe in the rural areas and stuff, but they started to bring themselves back into city-states so that they could put these shields up and, and, and support each other as their population is dying over time and they need the support of one another and they have to uh, have more densely populated areas to survive. And so um, I think, wasn't it like they had 6 million people on the planet or billion or something like that. Now it's down to like 60,000. I can't remember the numbers. <laughs> yeah. It was something like that. Like, yeah, it, the population was now in like the tens of thousands kind of thing. It was, it was quite low. Yeah. And it had been happening over the course of a century or so. So yeah, I, I found them to be quite interesting and they have some advanced technology, but doesn't sound it's as advanced as where the Federation is at this point. Which of course brings up some prime directive questions, which is, something that Bolana has issues with, with regards to Captain Janeway's dis decisions and the things she does, which I thought was an interesting aspect as well. So at this point, um, we, we Voyager of course takes this group of people back to their home planet and, you know, is kind of trying to, to see if they can help in any way, that sort of thing. And at this point, Seven of Nine and Bolana get separated from Voyager. They, they're they heading to the planet in a shuttlecraft. And something happens. There's, there's this big, I don't know, release of energy from this point on the planet, which knocks the shuttle for a loop and sends Voyager somewhere. Voyager seems to disappear. And they find themselves in this fold in kind of this starless space. So they're in this kind of pocket of subspace or something like that. And they're in this anomaly. There's that word again, anomaly. Uh, and Voyager is, is, is in this thing and it turns out to be kind of shaped like a bag. I think they say at one point with a, with a small opening on one end and that's leaking radiation from this white dwarf star, which the Minorans call the blue eye. Now, this is an interesting part because Voyager is stuck in this thing. They're getting blasted by this radiation and their shields are down. And this radiation has a particular effect on the crew of Voyager. A few effects, actually. Um, what did you think of this? Because this was what I call the crazy go nuts part of the novel. Yeah, this is where things get even more strange. So it starts off strange and gets stranger. 
Um, and again, this is kind of what I was always hoping from the Voyager series is things like this. But, you know, for example, Harry Kim is on the bridge and he goes to touch his console and his hand passes through it. And, you know, of course, that freaks him out. Like, what's going on here? Then there's a, a Bolian crew member, Ensign Grinch, that goes to sick bay and then all of a sudden just turns into goo. Um, there's also another officer that enters a doorway and when the shields are down, she kind of passes through the door and the shields come back up to prevent the radiation and the and door becomes solid again. But anyway, it kills her. And there's just like all these weird things and, and people are having issues like Tuvok, you know, he's having, you know, headaches basically. And just a lot of weird things going on. Maybe it's because now that I think about it, maybe it's because Tom is having too many of those mushrooms. <laughs> that must be it. Yeah. The one thing that got me from, from all of this is when all of the crew starts acting like with diminished brain capacity, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Like, for example, you mentioned Chicote ta- calling the aliens dog faced or something like that. It's like they say something and he says something like, shut up, you dog faced, whatever. Wait, what did I just say? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like Harry Kim kind of almost becoming really distraught when he feels like Janeway is yelling at him. Like, why is the mean woman yelling at me kind of thing? And, uh, you know, even Tuvok is out of sorts and, and yeah. stuff. So, and, and Chakoti sees this white light, you know, there's this focus on the mm-hmm. light and the doctor's, uh, hollow emitter program and whatever is kind of disoriented. He's just like half of a body at one point. Yeah. He's just a pair of legs in sick bay apparently at one point. <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, I, I I don't know. This part was a little hard for me to get my head around until I kind of realized what was happening and all that stuff. But it was definitely a bit of a crazy part of the novel. But of course, they do get the shields up and and manage to kind of overcome that. Now, there's some other stumbling blocks. So we have another Minoran who's come on board in the meantime with uh, a couple of other people as well. Sem. Yes. Who, and I will for, say that, you know, we're really starting to get into spoilers if anybody doesn't want to, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good point. I hadn't, I had forgotten to mention that, but yeah. So Sem, I, I have a hard time figuring out her motivation a lot of the time. Like what is she trying to do? And you said you kind of went over the novel a second time a little bit to kind of sort that stuff out. Sem is a bit of an enigma to me because she seems almost like an agent uh-huh. of chaos in part of this book. I, You know, Dan, this is so funny because, yeah, I told you I kind of skimmed through it again. And Sem was one of the main reasons why. I didn't even tell you that. And you <laughs> just called me on that. But I, <laughs> Well, I kind of told you, I guess, a little bit. But, I mean, there was something about her character that... I didn't really take as being a mean character or an evil character at first, but then she later proves out to be, but I was still even a little confused the second time around what her motivation was. Uh, It seemed to be that she wanted to rid Voyager of being involved. And uh, I think she wanted to follow the ways of this ancient teaching with the key of Grimadia, which we'll get to later, but she just seems to be a control freak. And, and, and I almost got the impression that if it goes one way, she wants to, to go another way. Yeah. Like, like kind of a chaotic character or something yeah. almost. There was one part I really liked with her just because it showed her ingenuity And that was when she was talking to Neelix about this humming she's hearing from the, the walls and you know, they kind he kind of susses it out and realizes it's the bioneural gel packs that she's hearing. And she, you know, Oh, tell me about that. How does that work? And she realizes that like with their limited telepathic ability, she can kind of tap into that and affect them. So she uses that knowledge to sabotage Voyager as they're kind of implementing this escape plan to get out of this. I I keep calling it a bag because that's all they call it. You know, I kept waiting for them to 
give it a, a an actual like techno babbly scientific name, but they just keep talking about the opening in the bag and stuff. So this bag that Voyager is trapped in this subspace bag. I yeah, guess. I was gonna say it's a subspace region. And just saying the way I guess it's formed, it has an opening. Like like mm-hmm. a small opening, like in a bag if, or like a satchel or something like that. But again, I don't really understand her motivation because she does sabotage the ship from getting out by lowering the shields and turning off the autopilot. But why does she want to be trapped there? Like, yeah. I don't really understand. I didn't really understand that. I almost feel like she just doesn't trust anything they're saying or something and is just kind of trying to sabotage whatever they're trying to do because she believes it's bad for her people or something. So she might not even really believe they're they're trapped where they are or something like that and that it's all a deception or something. I'd, that's the best I can kind of think of for her. Yeah. Again, I just really think she's just a control freak and it's like yeah. if somebody says we're going left, she says, nope, we're going to go right I mean, because she is a tribal spiritual leader. Um, And also, there's a strange thing later we find out, which, again, I don't really know. And maybe this plays out in later books, but we find out she's pregnant. And I guess it's Captain Ziv's child. At least he assumes it is. But they find out she's pregnant because she has a second set of arms. So Mm -hmm. when this... Or they're, they're very developed. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they can become bigger. And I, I don't know. I don't really know what her being pregnant really has much to do with anything, except when she's in the brig and, you know, he does the Captain Ziv just kind of worries about like harming the child that's growing in her. But I guess that's going to play out a little more later. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not going to. There's some mysteries, I guess, with Sem that I hope we find out in the later books. Yeah. The one other thing I want to say about this whole bit with Voyager escaping, one thing they realize they can do is, because at one end of the bag is that white dwarf star, they realize that they can collapse that star using trilithium. And I thought that was a really nice tie into Star Trek Generations and Dr. Soren's plans to collapse those stars. I know. Wasn't that cool? I kind of like that. I, I geeked out a little bit with that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I was like, what's the timing on that? And I looked it up, and yeah, Generations happens a few months before Voyager is thrown into the Delta Quadrant. So there's definitely time there. So That's kudos. a good point, yeah. There it is, yeah. <laughs> they got that update from Starfleet, so that's good. <laughs> yes, thank you, Starfleet. <laughs> the, the next topic, I think, is kind of one of my favorite bits in this novel, which is the interplay between Seven of Nine and Bellana Torres. So again, this I thought was a really good use of this particular time period in Voyager. Bellana t- was like very harsh towards Seven in that first season that she was there. And it's something I noticed in rewatching Voyager is that after season four, that kind of goes away. Like Bellana just kind of seems to warm up to seven fairly quickly. So reading this, I was like, oh, is this where that relationship turns around? And now she like respects seven of nine after this, because the show never really explained it. They just kind of stopped having her yell at seven of nine all the time. (laughs) So I thought like, Oh, this could explain it. So, which is the beauty of these books. That's, that's one thing I like about, you know, we, you can, if something isn't explained in an episode or the series, like, Hmm, how did we get from point A to B? That was never explained. A novel or comic comes out and can fill those gaps in. And then that's in your head the next time you watch it. And you're like, I know what happens. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, this this stuff between Seven and Bellana, as I mentioned earlier, they're separated from Voyager. They're in this shuttlecraft. And this event happens, this this explosion or this this release of energy that forces Voyager into that pocket bag subspace thing. It also kind of knocks the shuttle out of the sky, and they end up crashing onto the Minoran homeworld from this shockwave. While on the ground, they discover a facility that's like this epicenter of of where this effect came from, and they're apparently experimenting with a protective field generator, but they're not supported by the emergency council. They're, They're kind of doing experiments on their own, which is not sanctioned by the main government. 
and it was that experiment that caused the shockwave that did that to Voyager and knocked the shuttle out of the sky. So Seven and Bolana, <laughs> their relationship, like I said, is very antagonistic. And in the course of investigating this facility, there's kind of this explosion in this panel and Bolana finds herself blind and Seven of Nine finds herself unable to move her legs and so the solution to that is Seven of Nine convinces Bolana to let her inject nanoprobes into her, which gives Bolana a kind of Borg implant that grows over her eyes yeah. so she, now she can see. Mm -hmm. And Seven of Nine's nanoprobes use Bolana's spine as a blueprint to repair her own spine so now she can walk again. I thought yeah. that was pretty convenient, but like, okay, I can go with this. And the long-term effect of this is they can like hear each other, each other's thoughts. And as they're going through the novel, it's almost like Bolana becomes more seven of nine, like, and seven of nine becomes more Bolana like to the point that like seven of nine is like decking an alien and, and swearing about the shuttle's engines, and all this stuff. And it's really weird. <laughs> it's almost like freaky Friday. In a, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> they don't really switch bodies, but they have some influence on each other. But you're right. Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, 7 and 9 throws a punch at someone. And, it's, and, and 7 and 9 sometimes is just like getting really angry about stuff. <laughs> you know? And then even when this occurs, when the nanoprobes are entered into Balana, Balana says, well, I, I, did you? give me some kind of drug or something. Cause I just feel really calm. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you feel calm because you're part of the seven of nine Bellana Taurus collective. That's really <laughs> what's going on here. And so it was fun, but it can be a bit confusing when you're reading it because even the author puts it in here where Bellana is talking and then it says, and then seven said, but seven's not in that scene. And it's like, mm -hmm. wait, how did Seven just say, oh, because Seven is saying it through Balana. And then there were times they're com uh, communicating telepathically, in a sense, with each other, you know, and having conversations. I think Balana even refers to it as, you know, when she's talking to one of the aliens, like, you know, oh, there, it's a little bug. I have a bug in my head that I'm dealing with. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that you mentioned that part where, like, I think Balan is having a dream, basically, yes. and, like, she switches people in the dream. Now, when I was reading it in the book, I noticed that the switch happened twice exactly when you turn the page to the next page. Mm. Like, it's Balana, 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 flip the page, seven, 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 seven. And I was like, if that was planned, that's brilliant to, like, make it so that's when it happens is when you turn the page and yeah. then i thought about like if i was reading this as an ebook i wouldn't necessarily get that effect so like that's pretty cool for the printed version of this book that really if that was cool. intentional yeah i don't know that would be hard to do i would think um, yeah i would think so it might have just worked out that way but yeah i did notice that i like to think it was planned because that's that would be very clever but I don't know. That's interesting. I hadn't picked up on that, but I do remember seeing that. Yeah. And then there's this other thing, and this is a, you know, towards the very end of the book. And of course we're well into spoilers. The dream you were talking about earlier in the book, you know, seven is experiencing Belanda's dream of Tom and seven's seeing herself with Tom having just a domestic lifestyle with him. And she even looks in the mirror and sees bumps on her head and seven's a little confused by it, but then realizes it's from the dream. But then we fast forward to the very end of this book in the last chapter where seven is back on Voyager and Bolana's on Voyager with Tom and Tom touches Bolana's cheek and seven feels it. Right. Yeah. There's kind of a lingering connection there, which is interesting. Yeah, which I thought was pretty cool because it's that part is also important because there's a conversation Balana has with Janeway at the end of this book about something she learned about Seven by being connected to her. And that's the fact that Seven feels isolated. Seven's mm -hmm. not going to say that. And Seven may not act like she feels isolated, but she feels isolated and alone. And Balana thought that she herself feels that way. But 
for seven, it really is that way. So we have our Voyager crew that's stuck away from family and friends, and they're out in the Delta Quadrant, so they are isolated. But here is a character who's among this family on the ship, but yet she feels isolated. So Mm -hmm. there's different levels of this isolation in Voyager. And then when, and because Seven doesn't have anyone that she's really close to, she experiences this moment of closeness between Bellana and Tom with the touch of the cheek. And it's also, it's like her first indication of what it feels like to have someone in her life that touches you. Yeah, no. And it was, I think, I think that was really important in kind of understanding Seven's character a little bit more and also helping Bolana to kind of see things from her perspective a bit more. I really liked that conversation where she talks to Janeway about that and kind of reveals that little bit of information about Seven of Nine. And it makes perfect sense. I mean, she was part of a collective of billions of drones with all of their voices in her head as the collective. And now she's an individual by herself. And, you know, even on a ship like Voyager, there's only a hundred and some people on Voyager. Like most of us aren't that isolated, except maybe (laughs) right now in the midst of the (laughs) COVID-19 lockdowns that we all are in various levels of, but, uh, you know, generally we're, we live in cities or, or in, you know, and see lots of different people in different walks of life. But, you know, for a former Borg drone, it's got to be extremely isolating. And I, I thought that was interesting that the story highlighted that for sure. And you mentioned earlier in the episode, and it, it plays here later in the book now about the question of the prime directive, because as Balan is having this conversation with Janeway about Seven feeling alone and isolated, She's also returning to a conversation with Janeway where she told Janeway earlier in the book that she felt Janeway is careless. You know, they're trying to get home and then they run into these situations and these, you know, people from other planets and societies and all this. And we seem to always get involved in these things. Well, maybe we shouldn't be always getting ourselves involved and maybe, you know, we should just be focusing more on getting ourselves home And, you know, how much danger are we creating by getting involved? But then she starts to realize that sometimes it makes sense to break the prime directive. And she starts to tell Janeway that breaking the prime directive is good when captains know what they're doing. That the prime directive was really created for those average captains the not so great captains to follow those rules. But then there's people like Janeway, Chakotay, and she says eventually probably even Harry Kim that (laughs) can make rational decisions and don't need the prime directive to direct them that they can figure out was the best, best path between right and wrong and how to set up a situation where Bellana herself says that she herself can't do that. She can't think rationally in that manner that she would need a rule like a prime directive to guide her in a decision. I thought that was an interesting conversation and an interesting conclusion to come to. Part of me was like, well, that's why the prime directive was created to keep people who think they know better from, (laughs) but you know, (laughs) so I don't know that I completely agree with Bolana there. Uh, At the same time, I do like the sentiment and I think, you know, the captains that we do see on Star Trek do tend to be the exceptional ones that, you know, I, I'd, I'd trust Picard or Janeway, I guess, to take things into their own hands before other Starfleet captains. But I'm glad the rule exists because we also have, you know, Captain Morgan Tracy in the original series and, you know, I don't know, all these other people that set themselves up as gods on planets or something. It's like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, maybe those guys do need the prime directive. (laughs) Yeah. And that was my thought was those characters. Yeah. Those are the ones that need it. Not Kirk, not Picard, not Cisco on and on, on. There's some, we have so many lead captains now that I'm not, I just not going to name them all. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Well, to kind of close out here on our last bit of topic here, we have this kind of ancient myth, this ancient story called the key to Grimadia that you kind of alluded to earlier. So this guy named Dagon 
he was a farmer from this 14th tribe and he plowed into a rock that when he touched it, it gave him visions about their gods and their battle of dominance in the city called Grimadia. Yeah. So the, the, yeah. So these gods were, were in battle, but prior to that on this planet where the Minorans live years and years ago, each society had their own gods similar to earth. You know, we have different religions, different gods. And then over time it was concluded that all these gods really represented the same God, just different like aspects of it. So they kind of united around one God until Dagon, this farmer, his plow hits a rock and he touches the rock. And this is the key to Grimadia that he has this vision of that battle of dominance between gods. So It's not that they're all just kind of one God. Now we find out from this guy that he's saying his vision was that there's, they are separate gods that have been in battle. So now it kind of separates society out a little bit, but then, you know, as we were talking earlier, there's these 13 city States. Well, originally there were 14 and this 14th one believed. And I guess in a sense had a religion around this key that Dagon talked about and so they had this vision of going to Grimadia, this which is like an, a city in another dimension. And so they wanted to travel to this other dimension, and they were kind of outcasts from the rest of the planet before they even left the planet. So they had this 14th city-state. But over time, now these different societies start battling each other and attacking this 14th city-state. And that kind of broke things up and they kind of were then became isolated themselves and they really started to focus a lot on science and math. And then their society became important to the other city States because of their intelligence about science. So there's a lot of things going on and I may not be getting all this exactly right, but then there's this scientist named Gora that just says, you know, that, we can travel and and he's, you know, kind of practicing this mythology and this religion of we can all board a ship and go to Grimadia, wherever that may be. And uh, so we have a character, uh, Kator that was in the facility that was working on the, where the shockwave occurred. Mm -hmm. He is the grandson of this and he doesn't necessarily believe his grandfather's quest and everything, you know, that kind of thought he did when he was like in college, but he got out of that. But anyway, I know it's long story and all these things going on, which I think will play a lot later when we get into maybe the other novels. But I think a lot of this also has to do where Sem is coming from because Sem is wanting the key. And I think, you know, there was talk at one point that the key could be a weapon, even though it's not really a weapon and Kator has it. And Sem never realized that Kator had it because they used to be a couple. Mm-hmm. And, oh my gosh, it's uh, it's Days of Our Lives. It's General Hospital. It's some kind of soap opera going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I feel like I'm explaining. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely really complicated. And yeah, so Kator has this key, and I guess his grandfather or grandsire, they say, yeah. Uh, appears to him in a dream while he's sleeping in sick bay and yeah, this says is like the towards the end yeah yeah and it says you must give the key to her to her doesn't say who her is but to her yeah so basically he's like well it's not sem cuz sem is crazy <laughs> is kind of the conclusion he comes to. And he's like, I don't think he wants me to give it to Sim. So he interprets the her to be Captain Janeway, which is an interesting interpretation. And he ends up giving this key that he has hidden in like a music box, I think, in his home. And he he gives it to Captain Janeway. And that's kind of where that's left. So I'm assuming that's, of course, going to have repercussions and come into play in in the next two books at some point yeah it's got to somehow play into that because yeah we see this vision of gora as if maybe gora is still alive because Mm -hmm. you know they have these psychic abilities so that like you know there's some kind of connection there so maybe he is in gramadia wherever this is and he's communicating with the from this other realm or something that's what i'm thinking yeah whatever that other realm is yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. 
but a lot of ships haven't been very successful getting off planet to go wherever they're trying to go to so that, you know, they can get away from all the radiation. But apparently maybe this ship did successfully mm. get to where it wanted to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes because they've, you know, this, this book has an overarching story that they kind of wrap up sort of in this book, but there's definitely more to come. There's more plot lines and, and stuff coming. So for example, this white dwarf, when they collapsed it, it turned into this small singularity now, but they also detect another singularity a little ways off. And at the same time, uh, Neelix reports that Tuvok is missing. So, uh, that's kind of the mystery. That's the cliffhanger we're left with in the epilogue of this novel. And of course the next novel called fusion by Kirsten Beyer has Tuvok on the front cover. So this book had Bolana on the cover kind of focuses a lot on Bolana and her journey. I'm assuming the next book Tuvok's going to kind of be the quote unquote main character in the book for that one. So I'm curious to see where that goes. Yeah, me too. And I'm curious to see if the next book even plays off of some of the things we've discovered about these other characters. Like, you know, what happens with the seven and Bolana relationship after this, mm -hmm. or is this just gets played out in this book and it ends here? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm interested to find out, you know, there's so many things about this book that kind of touch on climate change in a fact, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense that, the shields don't necessarily work that well. And so the science is disregarded. And so that emergency council is uh, kind of fighting uh, ways to turn things around and just wants to basically leave the planet while others are trying to save the planet. I mean, it's not exactly climate change and what we're dealing with where some believe that, you know, we are have experiencing climate change and others don't, but there's, there's some parallels to that. So I'm mm -hmm. curious to see how that even continues to play out with the species and this planet and in the next couple novels. Yeah, for sure. Well, on that note, I guess, are there any kind of final thoughts you have with regards to the story and maybe a, a rating? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, well, I'm just starting to wonder. Well, I wonder where Tuvok is if he's not on the ship. Uh, Do we get any clues? I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah, right. other other than the fact that this other singularity popped up. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um. Oh, he launched a shuttle, didn't they? I forgot about that. Um, there he said the computer said he left by shuttle like an hour and a half earlier yeah, or something. Yeah. So. But anyway, hmm, that's very unlike Mr. Tuvok. Yeah. Why wouldn't he tell anyone? I don't know. Anyway, uh, what I think of this book, I enjoyed it. I will be honest. I at times got a little confused with certain things where I, I think just because there's a lot of things that are different and strange, like we're talking about, you know, now that I think about it. I remember way back in the day of the Bantam books, and I haven't read one of those in forever, or the early pocket book novels. Sometimes I would get a little confused because some of those things would be a little out there. And I'm not, and believe me, I think this one's better written than a lot of those, but um, it that's why I had to kind of go back and skim it again, just to make sure I got my head around some things. Mm. And sometimes I don't like that, but sometimes I do. Because to me, if... I think it's well written. It's just that there's so much that's different in there that sometimes it's hard to grasp and I have to go back and just read that again, which makes me think, well, that's good because I don't want it all to be something recognizable. It's got to be something that's different that I have to wait. Let me, let me go back and figure that out. So right. because of that and because of the characters in this book and the situation, and I like the Balana uh, seven stuff. I give it four out of five nanoprobes in Balana's eye. <laughs> nice. I'm sure she doesn't like them being there um, <laughs> for sure. But yeah, no, I, I enjoyed this novel. Like you, I got a little bit confused at some places, but again, this is a confusing area of space. And I kind of hear Harry's words echo in my head. I hate this system. It doesn't make sense. Right. 
there are confusing things happening and, and things are, are muddled and don't make a lot of sense, but I'm enjoying this book. And the other thing that I'm keeping in mind, of course, is that it's part one of three. And a lot of those things that are maybe still big question marks at this point, I feel like are going to get resolved or answered in some way over the next couple of books. So um, I, I admire the collaborative effort between these three authors. And I feel like maybe after the entire trilogy, it might be interesting to kind of revisit my thoughts on this book and how it fits more in with the whole trilogy as opposed to just by itself, because at this point there's a lot that we don't know. So I think my rating will have to be very similar. Uh, I think I'm going to give it uh four out of five, trilithium torpedoes designed to collapse white dwarf stars, but maybe don't quite do exactly what they're supposed to. So kind of, yeah, a, a strange effect of that rating there. <laughs> <laughs> I would say this really piqued my interest in what's going to happen next. I'm really interested in where this is going. So yeah, I, I like, and that was a little strange, but it does, like you said, it feels very much like Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, in in all the best ways, I think, for sure. But at the same time, with a lot of fun character stuff, which is what I really like in a good Star Trek story as well. So, you know, a kind of nice balance of both here. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're doing these in order because I'm I really want to jump into the next one now. Yeah, I'm excited for the next one. The only Kirsten Beyer Star Trek novel that I've not read yet. So until her new one comes out this fall. So, yeah, yeah I think I'm in that same boat. Excellent. Or well, such a same ship. Exactly. The same ship. <laughs> well, it's been fun talking about books that we've never read before today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.fm, Primitive Culture, a look at history and culture through Star Trek. I think it's interesting that the show keeps kind of bringing up these, bringing up these associations, even if it's just in the naming of a planet or something, um, you know, and again, sort of grounding it in our own history and our own culture and our own world to some extent. Although I think a lot of people, when at the end of The Impossible Box, when Picard says send us to Nepenthe and it was all in, in this kind of rather uh, a lot of drama and noise and stuff going on a lot of people thought they were ending up in the you know Klingon gulag uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good yeah. job that Hugh heard him correctly you know and sent him to the right planet because otherwise that could have been a whole yeah. different episode Earl Grey and sort of the reason behind it and why it's necessary and so I would of course keep this scene in I would too. I like Troy here. I think it would have been better if he got back to his quarters and he was so frustrated that he broke a table <laughs> and then Troy arrived. That would have, like, that would have made it perfect. Cube I think. Troy, um, yes. <laughs> exactly. But <laughs> nevertheless, she still arrives even though a table hasn't been broken. The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. Uh, anyway, our space whale is coming on the scene now. So yeah. they get to the bridge and it's yellow alert. It's a space whale. Burnham identifies it and explains that it's on the endangered species list and that they uh, need to transport it to a sanctuary. And so Lorca's like, fine, just whatever. So, <laughs> I mean, it's one of these points now that you sort of kind of think that looking back on it, knowing we know he's from the mirror universe, they would not have had that kind of regulation in the mirror universe yeah true. so you Absolutely can sort of true. one of those little peppered things where it's like yeah he's not what he seems mm -hmm. to the journey what do you reckon of this episode joe i for the see the way you feel about hugh and iborg i feel about one you think one's cute what there's something about one he's like hunky borg <laughs> Hunky Borg. <laughs> no, seriously, there's some something big and robust about him. Yeah, I definitely do that. But cat suits are a problem. Yeah, I don't go in for boobs so much. So <laughs> I like my Hunky Borg dudes. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. 
So check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. Well, if you get your podcast from Apple, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. And if you're not an Apple user, well, guess what? You got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, Spotify, and most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Those are available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. So are you still listening? Are you still paying attention? Well, good, because we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. And there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trekfm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select literary treks and they'll come right to us. And you can find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. We're all about books here on Literary Treks, and another site that's all about books is Goodreads. We have a group on that site where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as a currently reading section so you know what's coming up for future shows. Plus, there are great conversations happening about all the books and comics. Just go to goodreads.com, search for Literary Treks, and click Join Group, and we will let you right in. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shamutala, Justin Ozer, Jeffrey Harlan, and Casey Pettit for their support of the Trek FM network and for being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. Now, Bruce, when you're not in a shuttlecraft that is shaped like a brick, falling like a brick to a planet's surface far below, where can we find you? Well, you can find me building houses with bricks, or you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, and you can find me on Positively Trek Podcast with you, Dan, and you can find me doing a live show some Friday nights every once in a while on YouTube with Dan and Brandy, and I do a live show with Brandy when Discovery comes out here on the network called Live from the Edge, and I'm occasionally on the Star Wars Report talking about that galaxy far far away. And of course, I'm always in the Babel conference. And Dan, when you're not in Harry's closet growing mushrooms with your own fertilizer, where can people find you? Just don't ask where it comes from. And uh, it's okay. Harry doesn't mind the smell. So you can <laughs> find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can find me on youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, where I make videos all about Star Trek. And like Bruce said, we do those Friday night live shows, which have become a lot of fun. Please join us Friday nights on youtube.com slash Kurtratz Productions at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. We're talking about whatever episode the people on Twitter decided that we're going to talk about that night. And we call those shows now The Unready Room. Yes, because generally when one of us hits go live, none of us are ready. So <laughs> it's definitely a name that's stuck. It's a lot of fun. Really hope you'll join us. Uh, and of course, Positively Trek, like Bruce mentioned, that's our new podcast. Uh, we've been doing it for a little over a month now. It's been, uh, yeah, we started back in March. We're up to 12 episodes. We've got great things planned for that show. So please join us for that. You can find that. Just search Positively Trek wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all so much for listening. And as always, until next time. Live long and read on. What do you call that, light reading? To each his own, number one. <laughs>